From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. Yes, it's Tarzan, brought to you by CBS Radio. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan, the bronze white son of the jungle. And now, in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of the Night Riders of Pompeia. This is the fleetest camels we have, Macklin. Your orders are always followed explicitly, mighty Wazeri. You can drop that mighty Wazeri business when the natives aren't about. Whatever you say, mighty Wazeri. I don't know why I put up with you, Macklin. I do. Outside of your fanatical followers, I'm the only one who can point a finger at you. You've got them hoodwinked. But this is all a lot of hogwash, so far as I'm concerned. A couple of hundred natives mounted on camels and wearing hooded knives to attack a broken-down trading post run by a feeble old man and a couple of puny native helpers. Who are we trying to impress? We are not trying to impress anyone, Macklin, nor am I afraid of resistance this time. But fear is the emotion that rules men, and if we display a force the government can't match and a mask that no one can uncover, we will soon be the government. We'd better get moving or our men will reach the trading post before we do. Yes, let's hurry. We don't want to be late for the murder, destruction, and pillage so professionally executed by the night fighters of Pompeia. Wow. The African moon hid its face behind a heavy bank of clouds as the two men were joined by hundreds of other masked riders. No word was exchanged as the sand flew beneath the pounding feet of their camels, nor did they speak as they reached their destination, leaped from their mounts, and crossed the narrow veranda that led into the trading post. But then their savagery unleashed at last. The night riders of Pompeia struck out with their razor sharp feet. Life and property fell beneath their knives as they killed, thundered, and ravaged. Did you direct me to the office of the administrator of the Tamkia Protectorate? It's a disreputable looking edifice just ahead. I'm on my way there myself if you care to take along. Oh, thank you. That ramshackle place is the government building? Yes, that's it, all right. Office of the administrator, barracks for the protected police, post office, table for the camels, headquarters for... So they have camels there, huh? Were you under the impression our police walked across the desert? Or did you think they took a tram? I was really surprised at this. Well, never mind. Thank you for guiding me here. I'll say everything I have to say to the administrator. You'd better not give me the heave, ho. I'm Chatfield, and who are you? Oh, my name is Tarzan. I... Oh, Tarzan. Well, I know about you. What's your interest here? I happened to be in Mecurata when the sole survivor of a raid on an Arab caravan managed to stagger into that city. The caravan had been set upon near here, Mr. Chatfield. But I learned that it's become most common for unprovoked and unexplainable attacks to be made on both individuals and groups in this territory. Not only here, all of Africa's in a muddle. And yet, from what I've heard, even the violence of the Mau Mau terrorists in Kenya seems pale when compared to the savagery of the night riders of Tamkia. Yeah, perhaps. But I can't cope with it. Haven't the men or the ammunition? Nor the desire, apparently. Now, I'm an old timer here, you know. Been around since the time of the Boer War. I guess I've become a little immune to violence. I was sorry, though, to hear that the night riders attacked the trading post a few nights ago and killed everyone in sight. Well, the good thought, Cat Vanderbilt. Poor old cat. Dead? Yes. A man who has befriended thousands of Africans. Another hint that the night riders are not natives, Mr. Chatfield. What do you mean, another hint? The survivor I spoke of tried to give me information, but... He died with the single word Inglese on his lips. Inglese? An Arabic word meaning Englishman. How many other Englishmen are there in this territory besides you, Mr. Chatfield? None that I know of. Was a missionary chap not too far from the trading post, but I think he shoved off a year or two ago. Why do you remain here, Mr. Chatfield? Habit, I guess. 
Certainly can't be the climate or the pay. And yet someone around here is making a great deal of money through the sale of goods stolen from murdered men. I dare say, but these things pass, they always do. I doubt that the condition will improve so long as our official here is a man who's been in Africa for over 50 years and yet is unfamiliar with a simple Arabic word. Who isn't sure whether the only other Englishman within a radius of 500 miles has shoved off or not. And who shows a startling unconcern about a group of mass killers who have taken the law into their own hands. This attitude could be a mask to hide your own activities, Mr. Chatfield. You're barking up the wrong tree. I used to take interest in things, even took field trips when I was younger. But I can't even mount a camel anymore. I see. Well, perhaps I can reach the trading post on foot. And perhaps I can learn something about the identity of the marauders. Well, I wish you luck, old man. Too bad about Zandavok. So far as I know, he didn't have an enemy in the world. Not unless you can count that wastrel who used to work for him years ago. Oh? Don't recall that. Well, Vanderbilt finally got tired of his indolence and fired him. Wilkinson always threatened to get revenge. Now that you mention I it... I don't suppose you bothered sending the police to the trading post since the night riders made their visit? Couldn't see any need of it. Chap's taken over the place in accordance with the will Vanderbilt left. But... He had no family. Who could he have willed the trading post to? Fellow you mentioned. The one you said he fired, Harry Wilkinson. identity of the night Riders of Tomkia had been the single word on the lips of one of their victims, English, Englishman. And the attitude of the administrator had made him a prime suspect. But now the news that another English had returned to the district under strange circumstances shifted Tarzan's suspicion to him. And by late afternoon, the jungle lord had left the decaying capital city and started toward the remote trading post. It was during that darkest hour before dawn when he arrived there but the tumble-down structure was ablaze with the lights of a dozen acetylene lamps as a weasel-like splinter of a man minutely inspected his inheritance. Taking an inventory of your newfound wealth, Mr. Wilkinson? What? Oh, Carlton. You gave me quite a start, you did. Thought it was the night riders coming back for a second visit. Their first visit apparently accounted for your windfall. Oh, I wouldn't call it no windfall. Mostly what they didn't take, they ruined I'll be lucky to make 50 quid out of what's left. And Vanderbilt owed me more than that in wages. I seem to recall that he refused to pay you because you neglected the work you were supposed to do. Yeah, we had a bit of a row about it. But the old chaucer was a bit of all right, he was. I was all broke up till he got himself done in. You, uh, you arrived amazingly soon after his death. I was on the way here when it happened. You see, his nibs must have suspicioned the night riders was after him. So he sent a runner for me, he did. And the bloke he sent had a note with him saying I was to get the place if anything happened. I don't suppose you happened to keep that note. I did that. Got it right here, as a matter of fact. If you'd like to cast your papers at it, go ahead. Mm. Mm. Did anything happen to me? Yes, the note says that you're to have the trading post. He was more than a mite fond of me. And this was his way of showing he was sorry he pushed me out. Well, your legacy is not very impressive. They certainly... Turned the place upside down. He did a proper job of it, all right. They probably copped whatever brass the old man had in the cash drawer. But there ain't nothing missing from the inventory aside from some sort of chest. A chest? But Vanderbilt never carried furniture. It was some sort of a special order, I'd say. But whoever ordered it never comes for it. I'm sure it couldn't have been intended for any of the natives. Do you happen to know of any other Englishmen aside from the administrator and you in the district? Well, there's Alistair Meadows, a missionary bloke. I thought Meadows had left here. He had a mind to it one time, but he decided to stick it out. I think Vanderbilt had something to do with that. Mr. Meadows always said he'd bring religion to the old man if it was the last thing he did. But the old man had no patience for such things. Him and Meadows used to argue for hours and hours about religion. Vanderbilt used to say terrible things to the preacher. He used to get pretty mad, he did. Not angry enough to go to a resort to murder, I'm sure. But perhaps he can give me some information if I call on him. Well, sir, I'd as much like to find a bloke what's done in the cully as you would, Tarzan. Now to stare Meadows is a lot of natives that might have backed his word with their knives. You'd best have a little help with your chum. And Harry Wilkinson's your man. Well, here's the 
Here's the clearing where he had his mission school and his church. Looks like nothing but charred wreckage now. Maybe he did move on some time back. I think you will find the ashes of the building still warm. You mean you think it was just burned down today? Well, last night, just before the rain, according to those prints of camel's feet under the tree. The night riders? Undoubtedly. Perhaps their leader feared that Meadows might give information about him, and only one man had reason to suspect I might come here. Who is that? Mr. Chatfield. The administrator? Hmm. Well, stranger things than that have happened in Africa. Let's have a go at the blighter. I'd give a pretty penny to know who's causing all the trouble around here. So would I. A pretty penny to find out who rules the night riders of Tomkia. Another attack tonight? Has this mighty wizardy business begun to soften your brain? It is quite necessary, really, it is, Macklin. I have heard that a certain individual is hunting assiduously for the leader of the night riders of Tomkia. But you can't kill every other white man in Africa. I only kill those who oppose me. Then the Vork had become very suspicious. Meadows' religion threatened the universal acceptance of mine. And now we have a new threat, so he must be killed, too. Naturally. While Tarzan and Harry Wilkinson were traversing the distance between the demolished mission and the capital of Pumpkia, the Night Riders struck again. This time braving the capital city itself, spreading terror in their path, leaving death in their wake. And when Tarzan and Harry Wilkinson reached the city in the orange glow of dawn, it lay in smoldering ruins while the handful of homeless Arabs who had survived the butchery shivered despite the heat of the new day. And where was Mr. Chatfield, the administrator, while all this was going on, I mean? He was the first to die, Effendi. It was his fault the attack was made. It looks like we was wrong about him, eh, Tarzan? Apparently, but tell me, Uncle, why do you say the attack was the fault of the administrator? A few days ago, a stranger came and criticized him for his failure to apprehend the night riders. And when this man had gone, His Excellency called out the police, mounted the camel himself, and sallied forth to find their headquarters. The night riders must have gotten wind of his intent, for when he returned home, he found death awaiting him. So I inadvertently caused his destruction. Well, you shouldn't blame yourself, chum. Maybe we can find a clue at the old boy's house. Where is it, Uncle? The ashes are on the other side of what was the government building, but you will find nothing there. The raiders took an ancient Chinese rug the administrator cherished, but destroyed everything else in the city before they streaked across the desert. A Chinese rug? That's strange. You know what, chum? That chest what was missing from the trading post was Chinese, too. The bit of lighting said Hong Kong. But that caravan that's coming through tonight is worth a dozen of those we've attacked. But, Macklin, I have promised my followers that tonight we will have our ceremony. It is my sacred obligation to them. Sacred obligation, my foot. I knew that mighty was very stuff was going to your head. You have to get something straight. I got into this with you to make enough money to go home and live like a king. And I have no intention of risking my neck so you can stay here to become a king to a lot of stupid savages. It is most unwise of you to make derogatory remarks about the people here or their leader. Since the death of the administrator, I am the law in Tomkia. I can drain the land of wealth, attack every passing caravan without fear of reprisals, tax the natives who refuse to join me, levy tolls on every safari that crosses our borders and pass sentences of death on those who dare to cross me. No one can ever get away with murder forever. I can try, Macklin. I can try. Sounds like a lot of bunk to me. A hidden city where the jungle meets the desert. <laughs> a likely story. But aside from the... Strange enigma of a missing chest and a pilfered Chinese rug is the only clue we have. A city built by a man who organized Bedouins and Berbers into a salvage crew. I want to know that part of it, Jeff. Uh, according to the story, he combed the desert, collecting abandoned tanks, ammunition, and other war debris, especially in the vicinity of Tobruk. He paid his men more money than they'd ever seen before and kept a substantial fortune for himself, with which he built this stronghold that's supposed to be near here. Well, perhaps it is. Perhaps he's found a new source of income now that the spoils of war are gone. Well, this would be a rum place for the stronghold, if you ask me. 
Oh, I don't believe there's any blooming city here. Well, there could be one hidden just beyond that mountainous palisade ahead. Well, I don't fancy climbing that. Let's cut through these weeds over there. Wait, Harry. Those are Clancy's finds. Never go near them. There's a passageway through the rocks right, right there. Oh, why, I mean, right under me nose. I wonder if there's anything on the other side. I suppose we'll see in just... A city. A city of pagoda-shaped houses, of Chinese pavilions and temples. With ruddy heathen idols out front. The Orient, recreated in Africa. Look at the blight of coming to greet us. All swanked up in a hand-embroidered silk robe. Well, must have been warned of our coming. Welcome to our little community, gentlemen. Not many strangers find their way here. Well, it's not exactly a convenient place for guests to drop in for a spot of tea. Quite so. But you are most welcome, I assure you. Even though we come looking for the leader of the Night Riders of Tom Kia? Doubly so. But I have just succeeded in apprehending the scoundrel, a man named Macklin. Perhaps you'd like to look at his lost remains before I show you to your quarters? We shall gladly accept your hospitality, but we shall forego the pleasure of seeing your victim, since we're very weary. Come along, then. I have a comfortable load to put at your disposal, but one that I only recently found. Hey, you're English, ain't you, Governor? My name's Oliver Waterbury. Couldn't be anything else but English, could I? And what's the idea of all this Chinese junk in the masquerade costume? Going to a fancy dress ball? I have a great admiration for the Chinese. Their philosophy, their architecture, their furniture, their dress. And the oriental effects, I assume, impress my people. They're simple souls. They find their pleasures in such primitive ways. <laughs> doubt about it, chum. That was the chest he stole from the old man. He always used to mark his merchandise on the back with a piece of chalk. And the Chinese rug on the floor was undoubtedly that which once graced the administrator's home. Quite a coincidence, him giving us that particular room. No, it was no coincidence. He's playing a game with us. He knew the lock would be picked with my knife, and his camels are already saddled for the chase he's prepared when we attempt to flee. Well, I'll just as soon have a go at it now. I don't much care about climbing around on the roof of this here even temple. Harry, look. Look down there through this lattice work. Blimey, the night riders. Hundreds of them, all done up in their blooming hoods and masks. Let's get out of here, chum. Uh, soon, too much pombe in their stomachs will mean too few thoughts in their heads, and we shall need every advantage we can get. Look at the flyers strutting around like a potentate. Both riders of Tonkia, think deeply of the fine brew that I, your mighty Wazoo, have brought you with drink, the deal, drink deep, hot pombe for mighty Wazoo. Eat well of the delicious food your mighty Wazeria has provided for you. Eat food. Wazeria, see everything. Mighty Wazeria. And before the coming of dawn, two more enemies will be delivered to you. Two more enemies who defy the night riders of some gear. Yes, two enemies. Yes, two enemies. Kill them. It's going to set the best of us twice. They made their bid for freedom. Where was that one shouting from? On the roof! After the men! Death to the enemies of your worst enemies! <laughs> Already Tarzan and Harry had leaped to the ground and started across the desert. The infuriated raiders mounted their camels and sped after their enemy. Tarzan, half carrying the game little cockney, clambered up the dizzy heights of the palisade. And at his heels came the camels of his pursuers, stumbling and sliding as their riders forced them over the unaccustomed rocks. They were still skidding and milling in wild confusion when Tarzan wheeled and sped down the steep incline, his savage cry taunting them, begging them to follow. The riders, whipping their foam flecks mounts viciously, plunged downward into a maze of gargantuan weeds in pursuit of the jungle man and his companions. Suddenly, as the weeds clutched at their tired legs, the camels went berserk, throwing their riders, fighting them, pounding them beneath avenging feet. Then the camels fought their way free, but the leader of the night riders and his fanatical followers were enmeshed in the fibrous growth and held as though in a bottomless ocean of clutching seas. Remember, Harry? I warned you about it. Trying to take a shortcut through that vegetation on our way here. Those plants are as enslaving as a pit of quicksand. And those vines will hold our friends there until the authorities can arrest them. If they last that long under the blazing African sun. Uh, it was a bit too much for them, eh, chum? Yes, we... We have defeated another enemy of Africa. In a nice piece of detective work, I'd call it. Finding the blighters. 
It was an unusual bit of detective work, Harry. Often have I found an enemy by following his footprints, detected a crime through an impression of a finger or a hand. <laughs> but this is the first time I've ever followed a trail left by a chest. George Robinson is tired of the nine-to-five grind. His wife is sick of cooking, cleaning, washing, and picking up after George and the two kids. 18-year-old Marion, having had a fight with her boyfriend, wants to get as far away from New Jersey as possible. And Billy Robinson wants to hunt elephants and panthers. Comedy is mingled with drama as we relate the experiences of the American family Robinson. Tarzan, a transcribed creation of the famous Ed- Edgar Wright Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lester, with original music by...